nothing special because the mandate of the United Nations is not to find a silver bullet. Uh, the, the result of the COP, sorry to say, is oversold by the press uh, because the press is, as we say in French, passé les plats, the English expression for passé, passé les plats is, is when you repeat what the politicians just have said without asking any question. Uh, That's not a good translation. <laughs> And uh, so the politicians say we are going to save the world. So the journalists say politicians say we are going to save the But they are not. I mean, the, manda uh, the mandate of the United Nations is to decide by consensus with nobody special uh, to, to. It's not a company. I mean, you do not have a CEO who is making suggestions or giving orders. I mean, it's an assembly in which each country has one voice. Uh, the two Balu Islands, just like China. And uh, all these guys, they have to decide by consensus on the way to share an effort on which they do not agree on the magnitude of the effort. They do not share the same risks. So what they say is uh, it's important to uh, address the issue, and you cannot expect more. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, now if we go to the next speaker, and then we'll have sorry? Then first we can go to the next speaker, and, okay. then, and then we'll we have a general discussion. Hmm? Should we? Um, pardon me, you no, know, Richard Bach? I am. Good. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is, he's on the Stanford Faculty School of Earth Science and Senior Fellow at Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. And they climate science. Floor. All right, thank you. Um, I think I'll just say a few words uh, now. Um, So I think you know, the first uh, message coming from uh, a very large uh, community of scientists working to understand uh, the climate system is that uh, stabilizing the global temperature at any level, uh, pick your level, um, 2 degrees, 1.5 to stay alive, which was what I heard uh, when I was sitting in the plenary uh, yesterday, uh, particularly from the island nations, um, three degrees, four degrees, any level, uh, that stabilization requires net zero emissions. That's you know, fundamental. In fact, we saw it on the on the plot of the straight lines as it was described. What that relationship between cumulative emissions and um, global temperature implies is that stabilizing at any level requires net zero emissions. Uh, so as long as we continue to emit greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, we'll continue to experience global warming. The second message is that uh, we are already experiencing impacts from the global warming that's already happened. So we're now at about one degree Celsius of global warming relative to the pre-industrial, so halfway to, to two degrees. Um, and we're experiencing impacts now. We're experiencing um, impacts on ecosystems, a uh, whole suite of biological impacts that have been confirmed. Uh, we're also experiencing increasing extreme events, uh, so more frequent uh, heat waves, uh, more frequent heavy uh, rainfall events, um, larger storm surge flooding uh, during storms because of the sea level rise that's already happened. Uh, so we're already, we're already seeing uh, the impacts of of climate change. We're already living in a one degree world. There's a lot of discussion about two degrees or business as usual resulting in four degrees or more. Uh, but we're already in a one degree world. We're already experiencing impacts. We're already um, paying the costs of, of the global warming that's already happened. Um, I can talk about the California drought if anyone's interested. Uh, I think some have lived in California before. Yes, okay. So, so in terms of one example of impacts um, that my group has been working on uh, quite a bit over the last couple of years is the California drought. Uh, so we are now, by many measures, um, in the worst drought in recorded history in California. So more than 120 years of climate observations. This is, by many different measures, the most severe drought on record. Uh, it's likely the most severe in millennium, possibly um, the most severe in 10,000 years. Uh, it's certainly one of the most severe in the last 10,000 years, at a minimum. 
Um, we're experiencing uh, many, many uh, stresses from, from this drought, from this combination of low rainfall and, and very high temperatures, record temperatures. Um, so farmers um, experiencing uh, big stresses. Um, ecosystems experiencing big stresses. There are people who uh, uh, you know, are certain that extinctions are going on during this drought. We'll detect them um, as it ends, but uh, that, um, because of lack of uh, river flow, high temperatures in rivers, that there are species that are going extinct during this drought. Um, we had our lowest snowpack on record uh, this last spring, and uh, we re will rely on uh, snowpack for about 30% of our water supply in California, so this is a big um, even though, even though the last year was not even one of the five lowest precipitation years on record, we still had our most severe drought indicators and our lowest snowpack, and that's because of the very high temperatures that, that uh, we experienced. Uh, so there's a litany of, of impacts going on and on. Wildfires, tree death, uh, appears as though millions of trees have died during this drought. Um, so from a detection point of view, we know we know it's severe. Um, when we look back at the long-term record of, of drought in California, what we find is that, uh, number one, all of the droughts that we've experienced in California has, have come with low rainfall. So low rainfall is a precondition, necessary precondition for drought. However, um, we find lots of years with low rainfall that didn't have drought. And, and the key factor, in addition to low rainfall, is high temperature. So uh, when we look at the whole record of, of, of climate in California, 120 years of record, what we find is that um, when low precipitation occurs, if, it's, uh, if it also happens to be warm at the same time, that doubles the risk that the low precipitation turns into drought. And uh, when... Um, Often when I talk about this, people say, well, what do you mean? It's always, it's always warm when it's dry in California. And that's been true over the last couple of decades. Uh, but in fact, over the, the course of California's history, it hasn't always been true. And if we look over the, the, um, the 20th century, what we see is that about half the years were warm and half the years were cool. And about half the years were wet and half the years were dry. And these were independent. So basically like flipping two coins. And uh, if tails is, let's say tails is dry and tails is warm, um, the precipitation coin was you know, going half tails, half heads. And the temperature coin was going half tails, half heads. And they're both tails about a quarter of the time. What's happened is California has warmed substantially. It's warmed about, about the same as, as the global average. And what that means is that in the last two decades, 80% of the years have been warm years, and we've experienced uh, record record temperatures in addition to just being above the mean. So what this means is we're getting uh, tails on the temperature coin very often. And so now when the precipitation coin happens to come up tails, we get low precipitation. It's happening in a very warm or even hot environment. And so we know that, um, that the risk of drought conditions has increased because of this increase in temperature. We also know with very high statistical confidence that that warming of California uh, would have been, uh, is much more likely to have occurred with human influence. We have extremely low p-values if anybody wants to get into that. Um, we also know we're on the cusp of this becoming a normal event, um, and that's because uh, there's no sign that this warming of California is going to stop, even at the two degree level of global warming, um, essentially 100% of the years in California are likely to be warm or extremely warm. And so what that means is that, not that we'll have drought every year in California, but that every year that we get low precipitation is going to be happening in an environment that's also warm and that doubles the risk of drought. So that is more or less the basis of the governor's new normal statements. So um, that's where that comes from. So uh, that's a little detour on how we know that we're already experiencing impacts from climate change, including in California. Um, 
I guess I'll close with some uh, quick thoughts on uh, where we're headed, and, and this is really a <coughs> question of risk. Um, and I guess I I see less evidence for some of the statements uh, that have already been made. Um, there's no evidence that I'm aware of that global warming um, threatens the habitability of planet Earth, for instance. This is a lively discussion I've been having with my uh, students in my freshman class at Stanford this quarter. Um, and it comes down, I guess, to how one defines habitable, is what they tell me. Um, we can talk about that. But I think that the main thing is that we have um, clear evidence that uh, global warming will increase the risks of um, high impact extreme events, it will increase the risks <coughs> of very large uh, negative outcomes like uh, very large sea level rise, uh, forest die off, um, melting of permafrost. These are all real risks, and the more we emit, the more global warming there will be. The more global warming there is, uh, the greater the risk of these really high impact outcomes. Um, but I guess I have. Uh, we live, humans live in a wide variety of environments at present. All of them are on planet Earth, as far as I know. Um, but um, as, although I did see the movie The Martian, I don't know if that's out over here yet. But who knows? Maybe there are other options. Um, but I guess I, I, uh, I'll close by saying that uh, we have a lot of evidence for human ingenuity. And climate change is real. It, it poses real risks. And it also uh, creates opportunities. And I think that we have uh, real opportunities to uh, ensure that the global population that uh, requires um, fundamental energy resources for um, human well-being, uh, that there are opportunities to both supply that energy uh, that is needed for the global population while simultaneously uh, maintaining something like the climate system that we have now. But it's a, it's a real challenge, again, because stabilizing the climate system at any level requires net zero emissions, and that's uh, not the trajectory we're on. Um, do you think that um, I mean, California is one of the states that's been the most proactive in, in moving towards renewable energy and technology? Is there a general consensus in California more than in other parts of the state that climate change is real and human caused? And, and, what do you, how do you see that issue? Well, I guess there are a few questions in there. Um, and I'm not an expert on any of them. Um, so we do have experts at Stanford on the last part of the question about um, public opinion, essentially. And John Prosnick, who's a professor at Stanford, has been doing polling over the last two decades, um, since before he was at Stanford. And he argues that actually public opinion throughout the US is very consistent. Uh, over uh, the course of the last couple of decades with very high um, percentages of, of U.S. citizens saying that they essentially agree with what scientists say is the evidence. Um, pretty, much, pretty much across the board, and that includes across the political spectrum. He's argued that um, candidates can, are more likely to get elected if they take a, quote, green position. Um, and again, he's looked across the political spectrum, he's looked across uh, the geographical map, not the political map, but the actual geographical map of the United States and, and argues that it's, that it's actually um, quite consistent in terms of high agreement among the public. Um, I think if you look at what has actually been enacted at the state level, uh, these states have, have taken important Steps. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've heard it said already today that California is the leader. I wasn't the one that said it. Uh, someone else did, but it's been said. Um, so I think there, you could probably, maybe someone else has done an objective analysis, but certainly in terms of, um, in, in terms of uh, you know, the, the climate policies that have been enacted you know, over the last decade in California, I think it's, it's fair to say that, that California. Thank you. And perhaps I could ask you the same question as I asked John Mark. If you had the audience of the 
of the top negotiators, what recommendation would you make? Or what would you be hoping they would achieve? <laughs> so I think I I think that that um, I we have, we have very strong understanding of the energy balance of planet Earth, and it's clear that as long as we continue to emit net positive emissions to the atmosphere, we will continue to experience global warming. And so the um, any Any hope or um, misunderstanding that that's not the case uh, will you know, will not end up in in, in, in stabilization of, of the climate system. So where the target should be is is uh, is a matter of debate. It's being debated right now, um, but you know we're seeing the debate between one and a half and two degrees. Uh, it's interesting that that's that that's the debate. It's different than than COVID. Um, but I think that any of those targets is going to require eventually net zero emissions. Uh, so some people play, you know, some people in my position will ask an audience like this, how much of a reduction in um, global CO2 emissions do you think is required to get under four degrees of warming? Usually people say, oh, what, what do you all think? 100 percent. I mean, that's the answer for any for any level. It's 100 percent, and that's the bottom line. Thank you. 